Everything has an appointed season, and there's a time for every matter under heaven. A time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest what is planted, a time to weep and a time to laugh. Colleagues, friends, family of the extraordinary, visionary, galvanizing, and remarkable Vincent J. Scully, Jr., welcome. Over the centuries, Yale has been lucky, lucky to have its rightful share of charismatic scholars and teachers, people who've moved knowledge forward, changed minds and lives with their powerful teaching. Tales of Benjamin Silliman holding his chemistry classroom spellbound, or of John Pitkin Norton inspiring students and the general public about the practical value of applying scientific methods to agriculture, abound in Yale history. But I'm quite confident, confident that even among these, there is no single person in all of our over 317 years who did this as well or for as long a time period as Vincent Scully. And so Vince may be unique in the annals of Yale. I'm not going to try to say much about Vince now because many others here will do that today. Instead, I'm simply going to say that the single word that is appropriate for what he gave to Yale is our gratitude. We are grateful for Vince. Once in a long while, someone like Vince comes along and we are fortunate when that miracle, the miracle of Scully, happens to us happens to us here at Yale. This afternoon we'll begin with a short video clip of Vince himself, followed by speakers, other video clips, and some music that will bring him back to us and allow us, surrounded by the community of so many who loved him, to pay tribute to him one more time. Thank you for being here. kind of synthesis of those things that are in Corbusier and Alto, dominated all the time by this beautifully humane sense of the receiving of the light of every day. Now, this house has had a significant history. Now, it's true that when Hitchcock published it, he praised it for a very modern quality. He said it has almost no detail, very spare and sparse, no decoration, because he was still seeing it as a modernist. Now, this is the building in his book that caught my eye precisely for the same reason. Now, I was prepared to see basically still in a modernist way. George Hamilton at Yale, who was my advisor, put me in touch with Henry Russell Hitchcock, who was really the dean of architectural historians at that time. And he was a very generous advisor for me in my dissertation, which was on uh, American 19th century architecture. And then uh, I published a book about that, The Shingle Style, in post-World War II U.S., you'd see all of these, quote, shingle-style buildings, but you never knew that they were shingle-style or even architecture. They were not in any books. They were not talked about in any way, in systematic way. And suddenly, you have Scully present them with the complex arguments that he developed for them, both spatially, tectonically, culturally, linked to the literature, the politics of the day. It was amazing. Suddenly, what were just buildings became architecture. This is the General Motors Hummer of 1939. It shows you how nice it would be if really the whole town was, well, really just automobiles, and that the buildings, <laughs> that the buildings on both sides, you, know, you, you notice, are conforming to the spin of the road. 
The buildings are formed by that movement of those automobiles. The automobile is everything. It doesn't matter what you knock down, if you get from one place to another in two minutes faster by knocking down a whole street that's 100 years old, you've got to do it because that's reasonable to get there faster. I paid no attention when Philip Johnson and John Lindsay picketed to try to save Pennsylvania Station in 1963. Like most modernists at that time, I, I just didn't think of really saving anything. Everything had to be new. It was ridiculous. When redevelopment, however, developed in New Haven, I began to see you couldn't just stay in your ivory tower anymore. I couldn't just be interested in Greek temples. I had to come back to my hometown. Apparently, Arrow came out here and flew balloons at various heights. And he'd let some go up and he'd pull some down to try to get the heights of the towers. So the height of every tower was arrived at empirically and purely visually. The, the number of floors of rooms they have are determined by the visual character of its height. Then when Kahn came along, and he was here before you were at Yale, and you never studied with him. No, but you? I did my architecture on the top floor, at least yeah. a part and of it. And it was good up there. It was a great it was space. Good. Fantastic. Yeah. And this is the first building built when he's in his early 50s in which he tries to start again. If you compare it with that one, it too is very reductive. Huh? There's so little here compared with what's there, but there is a kind of strength. There's a kind of sense of a beginning. He's really starting here to try to understand what a classical building in a town is. This is the first modern building at Yale, and to my mind, the most moving. with the possible exception of the British Art Center. There are very few times in the entire history of architecture where an historian delves into an area of architectural history, studies it, interprets it, puts it before the audience, including young architects. This was one of the rare times when an architectural historian had a profound effect on architecture. It is not quite true that architecture was Vincent Scully's subject. He taught about it and wrote about it for more than six decades, and it is not possible to imagine greater passion being brought to it. But his true life's work was always something more, something for which the buildings and the cities that are nominally his subject were but a vehicle. And that is the whole idea of human community and culture. If his work contains any overriding message, it is that architecture is part of that larger culture and that its meaning comes from its connectedness to that larger culture. By now, it's almost a commonplace to observe that to honor Vince is almost like honoring architecture itself, which indeed it is, for he and architecture's noblest aims are virtually synonymous. But I want to say also that when we think of Vince, we think of something else as much as architecture, and that is the idea of the word and the nearly holy connection that Vince forged between architecture and language, the search to find meaning in this mysterious, profound, and glorious relationship that there can be between architecture and words. For what Vince did for his entire life was to use words, spoken words and written words both, in all their great and majestic power and beauty, as a way of helping us understand all that architecture is and can be and can mean. I first encountered him when I was 16 years old, an eager high school junior making an exploratory visit to Yale. A friend had said that since I was interested in architecture, 
I should try to look in at one of those lectures by this architecture professor, architectural history professor who, well, he didn't know quite how to characterize him, but my friend said I would not be disappointed. I was not disappointed. For four years, I sat in the law school auditorium. Alas, Yale would only give me credit for one of those years. But nevertheless, I kept coming back, sitting in those creaking seats, watching and listening, wallowing in words and rhythms that I loved hearing repeated again and again. His lectures were not unlike a favorite piece of music. And when you were 20 years old, you believe that any piece of music worth hearing cannot be heard too many times. Of course, hearing Scully year after year wasn't really hearing the same thing because the lectures were never exactly the same. Part of what always made Vint so special was that every lecture was different and reflected his thinking at exactly the moment he delivered it. It's from those years of sitting in the auditorium that I learned from Vince not only about Frank Lloyd Wright, not only about Louis Kahn, not only about Robert Venturi, but about several things that are much more important than any architect. Vince taught us all that serious intellectual inquiry need not be inconsistent with passion and that empathy is a true and legitimate part of analysis. He showed us that for all the joy there is in knowledge for its own sake, that putting knowledge to active use for social good is an even higher calling. And most important of all, that the making of architecture cannot be separated from the making of community. Indeed, that the very purpose of architecture is to make our common ground, our commonality viable, visible, and thereby to shape a civilization over time. Vince started his career as an unabashed celebrator of the most heroic ambitions of modernism, which he came gradually to question. One of his greatest gifts as a teacher was his ability to admit to both his students and his readers that he might have been wrong about something, that he had changed his mind. Ultimately, he would come to think of urbanism as equally important to form making and to cherish older buildings so much that he became an ardent preservationist. He expressed regret, as we just saw in that clip, for failing to speak out against the demolition of McKim's Pennsylvania Station, saying, in what became one of his most famous lines, one entered the city like a god, now you scuttle in underground like a rat. Not the least of the pleasures of going first today is that I can use that line without worrying if somebody else will use it first. In 1969, Vince wrote, in a much less quoted passage, that art history had to be conservative, experimental, and ethical. It was a remarkable trio of words one that in itself shows Vince's exquisite sensitivity to language. Conservative, because he knew that art history had to respect the past, since learning from the great work of history is central to its purpose. Experimental, because at the same time, Vince wanted to make the point that the real value of understanding the architecture of the past must be to inspire the highest creativity in the present and ethical because he believed that the noblest mission of architectural history, at least as he practiced it, was to encourage the building of community and the betterment of civilization. That is Vince's true legacy, his belief that words can change the world. No Yale president could fail to appreciate Vince's brilliance, originality, and passion, and the profound life-enriching impact he had on our students. That said, Vince did not always make life easy for a Yale president. <laughs> His respect for the perfection 
of New Haven's plan, borrowed by John Davenport from Ezekiel's vision of God's city, and his passion for the beauty and authenticity of its buildings and parks impelled him to hold Yale's buildings and their placement to an exceedingly high standard. Here's what he wrote at the conclusion of the book that we commissioned for Yale's tercentennial. University buildings should be among the city's most enduring. It is, after all, something like immortality that they deal in, offering an escape from the restrictions to life that ignorance imposes, and a promise to lives unborn. This should be especially true of Yale in New Haven. God's city under the mountain, haven of exiles, heaven on earth for all mankind to see. Wow. <laughs> this is a grand and inspiring aspiration, and in truth, we work very hard to be good stewards of the university and New Haven. But not every Yale project, proposed or executed, met Vince's test. And when we failed to meet his standard, he let us know with forceful argument and characteristic passion. Vince appreciated President Griswold's taste for modernist buildings. He celebrated Kahn's art gallery, Rudolph's art and architecture building, Saarinen's Ingalls Rink, and Johnson's Science Hill Suite. But here is his assessment of the Beinecke Library. <laughs> situated, I use his words, situated on an empty plaza that was sterilized for it by its architect, as perfect as a table radio, and conveying no more sense of architectural scale. Little wonder that Vince went on to torment Kingman Brewster by encouraging Claes Oldenburg to deposit his lipstick ascending on this very sterile plaza. Brewster earned Vince's high marks for Kahn's Center for British Art, but Breuer's Becton Center was a double loser, a truly terrible building built on a site of two buildings that Vince believed should never have been torn down. Consider these words, of withering scorn. Like the Beinecke, the Becton Center was essentially a late modern abstraction, a chilling demonstration of that design in folded paper at which the Harvard Bauhaus excelled. <laughs> the Pilates are flatly frontal, while the densely crinkled elements of the building's white facade, or the blinding white facade, seemed to be derived from the grave slabs of the Grove Street Cemetery across the way. <laughs> the rear wall rises up as a blankly geometric abstraction, especially obtrusive and hard to bear from one's sick bed at the Yale Health Services Center across the way. <laughs> you get it. Um, I had my own taste of Vince's wrath early in my presidency when we demolished Maple Cottage and when we made alterations that he regarded as intolerable to the balcony of the Berkeley College dining hall. During our most intense battle, I came gradually to realize that partially demolishing the Divinity School just might not measure up to Vince's standard of preserving heaven on earth. I surrendered. These skirmishes and other less charged conversations with Vince were the beginning of my education in architecture and urban planning. I was a novice, and Vince was one of those who helped me learn to honor the built environment of Yale and New Haven. Vince, Vince smiled upon much of the work of our later years, the construction of Venturi's Anlian Center, and especially the meticulous and faithful restorations of the Davies Mansion and three modernist classics, Kahn's Gallery, the Rudolph Building, and Eagles Ring. Vince believed that Yale's buildings are its greatest treasures. But anyone as privileged as I was to meet thousands of students and alumni knows that Yale's teachers are its greatest treasures. Even more powerfully than the buildings, 
Yale's teachers shape lives and give their students the tools to make sense of the world. Vince gave thousands of Yale graduates a gift of immense value, immeasurable value. The capacity to see, to feel the power of what they see, and to think critically about what they see and feel. Beneath all the fire and brimstone of this supremely articulate critic was a deep humanity. Vince cared. He cared about Yale, his students, and the football team. He cared about buildings and streets and parks, and not for themselves alone, but for the impact they had on people and communities. His brilliance, passion, and his caring touched us and inspired us, his city, his university, and most of all, his students. Ignoring the vituperative outbursts of ideologues, Vincent Scully made the battle for the soul of modern architecture seem like a conversation among reasonable people. An historian, a critic, and a passionate public intellectual, through his writings, Vincent Scully will continue to be central to architectural thinking for generations to come. I was privileged to study under Vince more than 50 years ago. His wisdom and friendship have benefited me over the many years since, ending with my time as dean when he was Sterling Professor Emeritus of the History of Art of, in Architecture. As a teacher, as we know and have already heard, Vince inspired literally thousands of students, Yale undergraduates who would take away from his classes a sense that they too had a responsibility to help shape the physical world. And the roster of architectural professionals who were Scully students constitutes a veritable who's who of contemporary practice, extending from those of my generation to a younger generation now reaching maturity, and even those who are just making their voices heard. It is for this reason, as much as for his scholarship, his critical writing, and his brilliant insights that Philip Johnson proclaimed him the most influential architecture teacher ever. Scully's path-breaking first book, The Shingle Style, 1955, not only put an enduring name to a hitherto undefined American tradition, it also provided us with a definitive understanding of and appreciation for the formal and cultural differences between European and American architecture. Spawning work by former students of my generation that he described with pride and not a little irony as the historian's revenge. Though fiercely committed to the discipline of art history, Vince was an active participant in the life of the architecture school. It was Vince who helped sort out the mess that lay in the wake of George Howe's retirement in 1954. And it was Vince who argued on behalf of Paul Rudolph, who he believed could best return the program to glory. In my student days, students came to Yale because of Rudolph and because of Scully. In the late 1960s, when architecture students began to protest against what they characterized correctly, in my opinion, as the overblown heroics of American modernists, and especially their participation in the destructive slash and burn urban renewal strategies that were then coming to the fore, Scully, one of the few faculty who commanded student respect amidst the protests, embraced their cause, drawing on his deep scholarship to help shape their argument but never abandoning his essential belief that protest carried with it responsibility for decorum. In 1990, when the university still held 
to a mandatory retirement age of 70, Vince was forced to give up teaching. He was furious, as you can imagine, and he enlisted my help and no doubt many others of you in this room to make his case to the president of the university for continuing on. But it was Thomas Beebe, the dean of the school, who saved the day by offering a teaching uh, position in the graduate program, which came with a much reduced salary. But that wasn't the point for Vince. He was overjoyed to remain in the classroom. By the time I became dean in 1998, Vince was more than ever a principal citizen of Yale, a force majeure to be respected, and as President Levin has already alluded to, on at least one notable occasion, feared. One of the few who dared to speak out about architectural issues on Yale's campus, issues of stewardship and respect for the past. When in spring 1999, with President Levin's support, I convened a symposium to assess the university's programs for renovation and new construction, one topic came to the fore the decision to demolish four buildings at the Delano and Aldrich designed Divinity School campus. Scully was the keynote speaker, but after reviewing the plans during the course of the event uh, that had been presented for remodeling the Divinity School, he asked that he be allowed to return to the platform at the end of the, th of the three day gathering, at which time before a packed audience including numerous architects who had been his students, looking directly at President Levin, he said, quote, if the Divinity School were rebuilt according to the present plan, I'd have to rethink my future in this institution. Loyalty can only be stretched, can be stretched only so far. Needless to say, the buildings threatened with the wrecking ball were saved, but even more importantly, Vince helped spark a, a renewed respect, as President Levin has made clear, for the role architecture can and does play in a great university. My own personal debt to Vincent Scully, as that of countless, of student, countless students, is immense. Because of Vincent Scully, generations of architects and others have chosen to pursue an architecture and urbanism rooted in memory rather than amnesia. With a scholar's knowledge and an actor's passion, Vincent Scully helped us to appreciate the empathetic relationship between humankind and its masterworks of the built environment. Perhaps his greatest contribution of all was that he taught us how to see. Well, I got up here, <laughs> and uh, I really don't know why I'm here, because Vince didn't like me, at least to the beginning. And uh, because uh, I breezed into New Haven uh, in, I don't remember what year, just when he had established a kind of master plan for the downtown area, and I arrived with the Knights of Columbus and plopped it in there, and a couple of other things. And for several reasons, he didn't like the Knights of Columbus building, but he, um, we sort of stayed away from each other for a long time, and then he. Um, we moved to a little uh, cottage on the, on the water, just on the bay, and we would go out there every summer with our children. And there was this man who rode past every Sunday, and it turned out to be Vince. 
and he was drawing a very expensive um, kind of professional boat uh, with long, very long oars. And after a few years, we started to wave to each other. And then he would occasionally come and play with the children, which is very nice and very, very sweet. So we got to be good friends. But our start was uneven because I really didn't have any sense of what was going on. Just to explain how I got here in the first place, uh, I was at school in Dublin during the war. Ireland was not involved in the war. So I graduated just as the war finished. And I felt I had to get out and go somewhere. And I went to London to Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, who were then the leading architects. And then came went back and decided I would come to America. The question is, where now? When I was at Maxwell Fry's, I saw a magazine which was lauding and that at least found her role very much. And I said, well, I've got to study with him. And so I, when I got back to Dublin, I applied to Yale, Harvard, and IIT, where Mies was. And incredibly, I was accepted at all three. And I can't imagine why, because I didn't have much left to show. But I decided to go with Mies. And just a brief story there. For about four months, he never talked to us. And then the, we got a little problem to design a house. And this was in mid midwinter in Chicago, and the snow was about six feet deep. And everybody designed flat-roofed houses. But I thought, well, you know, in Scandinavia, they wouldn't do that. Why, they, why can't you do a pitch roof house get rid of the snow? And so me looked briefly at it. And he said, you could do that, but I would not do that, you know. <laughs> and so I decided it was time to move on. <laughs> and I did. And uh, then joined Darrow Sarn and had a wonderful 10 years. I saw that when I came here, I was carrying all of Arrow's buildings because he died before he, he had planned to move from uh, uh, to try to where we were to here. And I had ended up with the responsibility to complete, to complete six of his buildings. And I brought all of that here and breezed into New Haven with all these ideas. And I sat beside a man on the plane coming here and very nice when it turned out he was the mayor. And when I got off the plane, I had the Knights of Columbus building and a new school in my pocket. So I thought, gee, this is a nice place. <laughs> uh -huh. Easy to get work. But then I ran sort of into Vince, and he couldn't understand what the hell I was trying to do. And we didn't speak to each other or inadvertently about each other for a couple of years. And then, uh, we could, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we got a cottage where he would row past and come up and sometimes meet the children. So we got to be good friends. And he was a very charming, very articulate, very wonderful person. And I agreed to do this even though he would have preferred, I'm sure, that I just go back and sh sit down and shut up.
The innumerable things that Vince Scully taught us, I only have time to focus on three. First and foremost, he taught us an art history that none of us had heard before. His passionate searing lectures glowed with familiar names to be sure, Giotto, Michelangelo, Palladio, but also Picasso, Pollock, Louis Kahn, and Maya Lin. But he also focused, of course, on well-known historical figures like Jefferson and Louis XIV and his military engineer, Vauban. Vince had a historical imagination and left us with a palpable sense of history, of the ages rushing by and new vistas coming to the fore. But for Vince, the past was never really past. It was always intersecting with the present. In a moving lecture, he shows how some of Vauban's 17th century forts were flooded by the French during World War II in order to slow down the advance of Hitler's troops. And I remember the sense of bitter disappointment when the lights went on in the law school auditorium and we had to balloon down to planet Earth and readjust to our everyday existence. We wanted to stay on on Vincent, Vincent Scully's magic carpet in the company of these great men and women, Brunelleschi, Titian, George Washington, um, heroic figures like Vince himself, larger than life, generous, lion-hearted, and this epic yardstick, which he used in his lectures, was the only one, of course, by which we could use to, to but the only one by which we could judge Vince Scully himself. It is not by chance, I think, that so many of his lectures touched on the subject of war. He wrote memorably about Michelangelo's fortification drawings for Florence, or those of Vauban, or of Edwin Lutyen's great memorial to the dead, the dead soldiers who died at the Battle of the Somme in World War I at Thieval. There were still battles to be fought, battles that we had to fight. And Vince wanted, he fought for an art history that came down from the sacred groves of Academe. And he was deeply, deeply concerned, involved, engaged in the contemporary world as an art historian. In 1989, when the Corcoran Gallery of Art bowed to pressure and canceled an exhibition of the work of Robert Mapplethorpe, Vince gave a stirring lecture about freedom of expression, reminding us that we had to stand up. Again and again, he brought up civil rights in lecture. And as President Levin and uh, several, Bob Sturm also have pointed out, when his beloved Yale threatened to tear down a building, Vince thundered at his alma mater, and the words he used in lecture to us students was that Yale acted like a, quote, mean little Yankee institution. <laughs> Art history had to be militant and proactive. It had to intervene in the world around it. Second thing has already been brought up by Bob Stern. Vince taught us how to see. But the way he taught us, he taught us how to see, he, uh, sorry. Um, Vince taught us how to teach. The way he treated us, the way he corrected us with humor so, as not, so that we would not be humiliated, uh, the way he vetted all our talks before we became ridiculous at symposia, he always vetted us, he gave us time. These were all invaluable lectures for the future. And there was also his and Tappy's warm hospitality in their home. And in every one of those dinners, every time, Tappy would begin a story and pause in mid-sentence, and Vince would finish the phrase for her. It wasn't until many years later when I myself was married that I was aware of how unusual that was, a husband and wife with the same version of the same event. <laughs> you were a partnership, working closely with one another. And that, too, was a lesson that stayed with us. Finally, and here I come to Bob Stern's point, Vince taught us how to see. But for Vince, seeing was not something passive. It wasn't something that just happened. It required work, commitment, risk, and always imagination. All of us who studied with Vince have taken detours of 100 miles or more 
to see something he had mentioned in lecture. And how many of us grad students would find ourselves one day in a back country road in Italy under a torrential downpour, waiting for a bus that might come in an hour or two or a day or two? You look down your clothes, your new leather shoes were ruined. Mud falls, oozing out. But you didn't care. We had just seen a Palladian villa that Vince had mentioned, and we knew that our life was enriched, amplified by this experience. But Vince could never teach us to see the way that he did, because he had an exceptional ability to compare things that were separated by thousands of years, for example, or thousands of miles. And when he made these startling connections, he was always right. And a striking example of this has already been brought up by Professor Levin, was this precisely the peril that he brought up between the urban plan of New Haven and Ezekiel's vision of the ideal city. Nine perfect squares with 12 gates and a temple in the center facing the sea. But Vince was not, it was not about pure formal analogy. It was always something more. He was always after the bigger picture. And he adds, quote, it is touching that the city Ezekiel described is intended as a refuge for the people who left Jerusalem after Jerusalem was taken and destroyed. As he wrote in Yale and New Haven, Architecture and Urbanism, the book he co-authored with Tappy, Paul Goldberger, and Eric Vogt, New Haven is Ezekiel's vision to the life, the nine square city by the sea, the red mountain flaring. It is the new Jerusalem, the most perfect of all the Puritan towns. And we shall now hear the Society of Orpheus and Bacchus sing a version of Jerusalem that was rewritten in order to reflect Vincent Scully's vision of his native city as the New Jerusalem.
President Salovey, Tappy, members of the Scully family, please know it is for me a very great honor to take part in this memorial tribute. A student is here to be taught to see and to believe that anything is possible, he told me in an interview for a piece I was writing about him for the old architectural forum in 1959. He was 39, I was 26. On another occasion, only about 10 years ago, we had met one evening for a drink at the Yale Club in New York. And as we stepped out of the elevator at the second floor and walked into the main lounge, he stopped to look up at, at the spectacular ceiling of that room and exclaimed very softly, almost as if he were talking to himself, God, I love Yale. <laughs> he had only just gotten off the train from New Haven. But then, of course, the Yale Club is another of the masterworks outstanding works of James Gable Gamble Rogers, the genius who created Harkness Tower and so much else all around us here. Less than a year ago, in the course of a conversation, I asked Vince, who was your favorite teacher? Who had the most influence on you? He said she was his New Haven High School English teacher, senior year, Miss Sheridan, he said. She re made me read the New York Times every Sunday, and, and especially the book review. It was then I came to realize, as I never had until then, how much there was to read. And I began reading books, books of all kinds, as never before. Already by the 1950s, when I was an undergraduate, his talks filled the whole lecture hall, the old lecture hall in the art gallery. Every seat was taken, and many who were unregistered for the course would stand along the side walls or sit on the stairs leading up to the balcony. He would enter moving fast and go immediately up to, on stage make a few quick remarks about schedules or something of that kind in a rather nondescript quick voice. Then the hall would turn dark, very dark. A large image would fill a giant screen behind him and the show was underway. The voice, now strong, fervent, slightly theatrical, would unleash what one friend of his called a musical avalanche of picture-making words, never relying on a written script or notes and stopping only, only to bring out the heavy 10-foot-long pointer, on the, bang it on the stage floor to signal a change in the image on the screen. There's one story that he was, got so excited one day, he fell off the stage onto the floor and kept right on with his lecture. <laughs> I certainly do believe it. Often to make a point about a particular painting or work of architecture, he would throw in an unexpected quote from James Joyce or Scott Fitzgerald or Pilgrim's Progress or The Odyssey, you name it and often with marked effect, though there were times when the connection seemed a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Many of, the most, of his most impassioned lectures would be long remembered and have far-reaching effect. For me, it was those talks he delivered on the great cathedrals of France, Desolais in particular, and Jefferson's campus at the University of Virginia, and yes, on the Brooklyn Bridge. From those of us who were students here in, in, in my time, it was important also 
that he had served in World War II as an officer in the Marine Corps in both Europe and the Pacific. Nor did it matter that he and the other veterans on the faculty at the time seldom ever talked about the war, if at all. They didn't have to. One beautiful spring evening back then, one or two of other, of, uh, two other students and I were coming out of the Torch Honor Society with Vince, when suddenly he stopped and looked up at the Sterling Tower just down College Street, glowing in late golden sunshine. Look at that, he said. Architects don't build just with steel and stone. They build with light. He helped us to see as no one ever had. Helped us also, importantly, to understand that history is far more than just politics and war. He showed us what he loved again and again and with genuine infectious enthusiasm. We can never say enough in tribute or in gratitude to our great teachers. In so many measurable ways, they are the most important and admirable men and women of all. We can never give them enough credit or, expe or express sufficient appreciation. Above all, they, they have generation, generation after generation, shaped our values, our sense of purpose, our desire, desire to excel in whatever it is we chose to make of our lives. And how wonderful that for all the time Vincent Scully spent in Greece, in New Mexico and elsewhere, all the ground he covered geographically and in his mind, there was no place he so loved as New Haven, Connecticut, his home ground. What an uplifting life story he remains. The scholarship boy who became a national treasure. Gone but not forgotten is the old expression. It's my view that if not forgotten, they're not gone. On we go. You all know what this is. I asked it to be put up here on the stage as a, as a kind of an homage to Vincent in an effort to garner your attention during my short talk. Thank God no one turned out the lights. We all knew Vincent in different ways. In my case, he was a mentor and an inspiration over the course of a lifetime. Whether as his student, occasionally looking at slides in the slide room in preparation for his next lecture, in my career as an art dealer, or as the owner of the Miami Marlin baseball team, I implemented lessons he taught me every day of my life. I wouldn't be where I am in my life without him. In the late 1950s, oh, that's so long ago, I started taking classes at Yale in the art history department, and it became my major, mostly because of the indelible impression Vincent made upon me, like he has done for hundreds and maybe thousands of others. He was more than an art and architectural giant. 
He was magnetic. Part brilliance, part showmanship. When he spoke, you listened. The things he taught me, I couldn't have learned anywhere else. He was about energy, truth, high standards, wisdom, inspiration, poetry, and certainly made architecture come to life. I've been around many of the world's greatest painters and sculptors, and being in Vincent's company was no different. In my life, visuals and interpretation are always critical. And it was Vincent who taught me how to use my eyes to see, not only the given and the obvious. How do you measure works of art and architecture against one another? and against your own knowledge. Are they good? Are they great? Are they successful? It's all about using your eyes. I wondered then, and probably still wonder now, how the hell he could see the things he saw. His eyes missed nothing. In his humanistic approach to architecture, buildings were living entities, not just slabs of concrete populating the horizon. And he taught me that we live the way we do because of the things that surround us. We take too much for granted, he often said to me, and are comfortable with the status quo. Well, Vincent often always said that you don't have to accept being crippled by visual pollution. I never forgot that. I remember Vincent calling me one day to elicit my help. Apparently, and you've heard this before, there was a discussion about removing some of the buildings at the Divinity School, which he felt was a crime. Those were his words. He felt that it still had more years to live and had an important place on campus. He asked me to call President Levin and lobby for his cause. The buildings were saved, certainly not because of me, but rather because of his Herculean efforts to pull out all the stops for something he believed in. When my daughter arrived at Yale many years after me, I suggested she take his course since he was nearing the end of his career. Sure enough, the year after she took that course, he retired. He would come back as a visiting professor and teach classes once in a while, smacking that loud pointer on the floor to capture the audience's attention, have the lights go out and the magic begin. I audited one of his classes many years ago, along with my wife, Julie, and noticed that everything was the same, except instead of feverishly scribbling notes on paper, paper Students were now feverishly typing away on their laptops. It's beautiful that he had such a profound influence on so many generations. Vincent was such a towering presence on campus that even his little French Citroen automobile, which he usually parked on Park Street behind Pearson College, was always very visible. I recall one day walking down the street with a group of friends and football players, and we all spotted the car. One suggested that we pick it up, carry it across the street, and put it on the steps of St. Thomas More Church. <laughs> the following Monday, at his art and architecture class, Vincent came in, slammed his pointer to the ground, looked at everyone in, the seat, in their seats, and said, who were the wise guys who put my car on the steps of the church? <laughs> there were no responses. <laughs> At a Yale, football, a Yale Harvard football game seven or eight or nine years ago, I mentioned to Julie that I was going to tell Vincent about that incident. <laughs> Enough years had passed, and I thought he should know. I turned around and described it to him. 
and took full responsibility. He gave me a hug and said, that was so marvelous. <laughs> he, he carried no grudges. He had a great sense of humor. Last time I saw Vincent was in Miami when he and Tappy were living there. I always invited them to come to the ballpark on opening day, which was always very festive and a wonderful experience. He loved the combination and the commotion and the camaraderie with the players and the uplifting atmosphere. And he would always call me afterwards to say thank you profusely and comment on the energy. I don't know what the energy he was looking at, but there were lots of cheerleaders. I knew that all was well in his eyes and his heart. Recently, I began to think a lot about him, and tremendous emotions came roaring back. In my mind, I wanted to call him and see him again. Exactly 12 after hours after I had that thought, I heard that he had passed away. Timing is everything. Glowing obituaries came roaring in from the New York Times, the Washington Post, Associated Press, and others, barely capturing the positive impact he had on generations of architects, and most importantly, young, aspiring, curious minds, many of them here at Yale. Many of those who took his introductory course never went on to study art history, but the exposure of, to Vincent's world I'm sure, made them even more curious about their environments. I love the man dearly. Now we are left with the memory and his writings and an indelible image of a genius. And we have opportunity here now to honor his legacy by inspiring the next generation to ensure that his magical spirit continues. Thank you. Vince was simply the most inspiring and influential teacher I had as an undergraduate. Like so many students, I was enthralled by how Vince would take us from the Acropolis to Monticello and to the Pueblos of New Mexico, all in an hour, leaving us in absolute awe of the power, beauty, and import of these great works. When I returned to Yale Architecture School, I was his head TA for my years back at Yale. And I would often stay with him in the art history slide room and watch as he would put that day's lecture together with his incredible concentration as he composed the day's talk, each lecture totally afresh, with hundreds of images to be projected side by side all laid out on the light tables in the art history slide room. It was a rare opportunity to see a master at work and to begin to understand how his ability to thread that day's lecture together was a brilliant composition that visually flowed and connected as well as being thematically and conceptually linked. This visual composition created an almost film-like sequence and allowed you to easily sit through hundreds upon hundreds of images in that darkened auditorium, like individual film stills, all pieced together and connected with his moving, booming, passionate voice. And this sequencing made it so easy for him to quite literally transport you from the Pueblos of New Mexico to the stone monumental structures of Mesoamerica to the Grand Canyon, and then on to the canyons of New York City. These talks would literally at times take your breath away and leave you in awe of the power of architecture, actually in the power of the human spirit that, would create, that could create those works. For Vince inspired us to think about the humanity within architecture and how the built environment influences who we are both as an individual 
and as a society. His was a belief that architecture can elevate the spirit and can inspire us to help shape our world for the better. I, for one, owe Vince such a great debt. It was in my senior year, my very last seminar, where Vince described a World War I memorial to the missing in Thiepval, France, for the Battle of the Somme that Sir Edwin Wetchens had designed. He described it as a psychological journey to an awareness about loss, and that you had to walk through a gaping scream of an archway inscribed with the over 70,000 names of the missing from the Battle of the Somme. And as he so powerfully and eloquently described the experience of that memorial, I realized that a certain project of mine that I had designed for a fall class project for, it was a memorial to the Vietnam War, had a similar psychological experience. It was a journey to an awareness about loss. Although the two designs could not have been more different formally. While still in that class, I started madly writing. Vince was more than a little curious, but that written description of the design was the final part that I'd been struggling with before I could send the competition boards in. And Vince's description of the Lutchens Memorial was instrumental in making me understand that my design worked on a similar psychological level. He made you feel architecture was a living and breathing presence. For those of us fortunate to have pursued the arts and architecture, his was a voice that impressed upon us the deep responsibility we each would have in making our own works. And for so many others, he inspired a sense of wonder, respect, and responsibility for the built environment. He gave you a deeper understanding of how much our built works express our very humanity, and how much through these works we can and should influence and shape society. Vince urged us to think of the great social responsibility, responsibility these works could have. In his own voice, in his introduction to American architecture and urbanism, he writes, there is no difference between architecture and city planning. All must now, or rather again, be treated as one. This must be especially so because of the fact that every citizen must now share an active and critical responsibility for the future of the American city. As for that of the American community as a whole, his vote and his direct personal intervention and his own community can help determine the kind of world we will make. He made us want to help shape a better world and the world will sorely miss him. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be with you. I speak representing my partner, Andres Duani, who's here, and many friends in Miami, where Vincent Happy had a home for some 20 years. Vincent Scully represents an era, a time in modern architecture that, influenced by his teaching and writing, sought reconnection with historic glories. Confronting a building in the classroom with drama and urgency, as Michael Lewis put it, one of many recent articles about Vince. Confronting a building in the classroom had the effect of making all architecture contemporary. Vince taught us to value all that was good in architecture, eschewing ideology, a gift allowing us to appreciate the world around us with freedom unfettered by ideology for which we are grateful. And the conviction that past and present are one has guided generations of his students. It's important to review the Scully era. In the future, it may be seen very differently, differently than our experience of it. 
Already, sometimes, it is misrepresented as cosmetic fantasy. He might exhort us all to make a record of this time from our own experiences to keep this record straight, that others may not skew the perspective. For many here today, it is not an exaggeration to say, if not for Vince, we would not be doing what we do. As students, we understood his historical benchmarks and imagined our own work having a life between the achievements of our predecessors and a future that would support continuity. And we assimilated his principles of civic responsibility in preservation and urban engagements. Scully's own such engagements ricochet still today. In still remembered critiques of development in Miami, I'm still hearing about them, and the renewed impetus for the revival of New York's Pennsylvania Station, which is also still an ongoing discussion. Many have said that Professor Scully changed the course of American architecture. Indeed, the breadth of his audience and his influence on the built environment brought wide recognition, much of it from beyond his home in academia, even from the real estate development industry. Consider his award from the Urban Land Institute in 2003, the J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development. What other academic can claim honors from such a quarter? For Andres and I, the Scully era had two phases. The first, as students and young architects trying to imagine that we were part of the historical continuum. We still remember vividly the intellectual awakening and excitement of the Scully lectures. From those emerged our interest in the whole of American architecture, not just in public buildings and monuments, but in the American house and the American community. This was the foundation for the movement called the New Urbanism, and the assessment that it was time to recover the beauty and good sense of American settlements. It also encouraged the traditional and classical architecture revival that thrives across the world today. The second phase began when Vince and Tappy joined us as colleagues at the University of Miami. They were a team. He taught his favorite courses, and she taught American architecture and preservation. They came to love the Florida vernacular, including the modest and dignified early ranch houses, one of which they chose to inhabit. Vince loved our affinity with the Caribbean, and he encouraged us to emphasize the distinct, that distinction. Vince and Tappy truly adopted our school, giving impetus to the faculty and students to seek a regional identity. The success in doing so is chronicled by them in the book Between Two Towers and is evident in numerous ensuing faculty publications and buildings. We remember with happiness those special years in Miami. We are grateful to have known Vince's creative intellect, generosity and mentoring, principled passion, a mischievous sense of humor, and above all, his loyal friendship. And dearest Tappy, we look forward to your return to Miami. Hi, more shades of Yale. Um, none of us knew Professor Scully personally, but we've been told that he loved undergraduates, that he loved teaching them and learning with them, and he always stood up vehemently for what he believed in. And so we're so honored to be here and to help pay tribute to his memory. This is We Shall Overcome. We 
I just have to do this first. You know who's here? Helen Chilman at 91 years old, the slide librarian who made everything possible for Vince. And I think it's right to clap for her and for all the projectionists and all the slide runners and all the TFs. And if you're at home watching this, you can stand up and we'll applaud you now. <laughs> Here is the scene. Checkerboard Films is making a film on Vince. And as the master of JE and a special assistant to the president, I have been asked to go with my dear friends, Vince and Tappy and the video makers, and show the way to various Yale buildings and open gates with my swipe card. Now it is the middle of the day, and with the video team, we are at the Yale Bowl. It is the December and the place resembles Vostok, Antarctica. Icicles sticking to the hard seats where we are sitting, a tundra of grass before us, nothing like the bowl on a gorgeous autumn day. I am sitting there waiting for Vince to say something wonderful about this Yale place which he has known since his childhood and which he loves so well, when suddenly he turns to Tappy and me, the cameras are rolling, the audio is on and says, you know, Harvard Stadium is a better place to watch a football game. <laughs> Shock and horror. I gamely smile and nod for the cameras while my stomach falls 25 stories on a crashing elevator. What? 
the dreaded Harvard, the school that has caused us so much ecstasy when we beat them, and agony whenever in the gloom of a gathering winter evening they ground us into the dust of our field of dreams. Truthfully, I had often heard Vince say that about Harvard Stadium. Harvard Stadium is great, Penny, because you sit on that brutal concrete. It's warlike, it's death against life, it's the Roman Colosseum with the gladiators. You sit right up there on top of the action where you can hear the cries of triumph and anguish echo across the way. But he always said it in the context of our perfect mutual understanding that, of course, nothing, nothing, nothing matched the expansive magnificence of the bowl, inspiration for the Rose Bowl, the Michigan Stadium, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Nothing matched that on a gorgeous fall day. And frankly, I didn't think he ever would praise anything about the dreaded Harvard on a film about himself and Yale. So this little episode made me think about Richard Conniff's words about Vince, that he was the perfect inside-outside man. But actually, while that phrase has a rightness about it, the truth is that Vince was not an inside man, or an outside man, or an inside-outside man. And that is because he wasn't anybody's man at all. Maybe Tappy's, but nobody else's. And, um, he was determinably, irrefutably, unstoppably, and unceasingly his own person. And in the black pit that covers us from pole to pole, he was the captain of his ship. He was the master of his soul. I met Vince in the 1970s when I was teaching in Yale's English department, and Vince reached out to my late husband, the poet and translator Robert Fitzgerald, because he loved Homer and admired Robert's translations and we became friends. But I really came to know Vince and Tappy in the latish 1980s when we began going to football together. I discovered that Vince and Tappy, as Vince had done most of his life, they were sitting in the cheap seats, far from the action. As Yale's somewhat improbable faculty athletic representative, I had four amazing seats in Portal 16, right behind the president, and I offered two of these to Vince and Tappy. Vince theatrically snorted and twitted me mercilessly. The very idea that he, the son of a New Haven alderman, the fiery defender of Yale radicals and the occasional gadfly troublemaker to Yale presidents, whom he nevertheless loved and always underlined protected him, the very idea of sitting up there with the establishment horrified him. <laughs> but allow me to convey that despite those frightful reservations, he took the seats. And so, for over a quarter century, he and Tappy and I, through sun and rain, through heat and snow, year in and year out, through ecstatic winds and catastrophic losses, sat in them together. Even early on, I always knew that going to football as we did was not only about the football, though it was about that. Football games connected Vince to his New Haven childhood when he told me he and his father would walk or ride out on the trolley to the bowl and his father would lift him up and sometimes even put him on his shoulders so he could see the fury of the game above the crowd. It was about driving through the New Haven streets to get to the bowl because he knew every street and everyone evoked a memory. It was about parking on the side of Edgewood Park and walking through autumn leaves past the duck pond and then up Chapel Street, entering the complex and going through the dark tunnel and coming out, out, out into the sky with the blue Yale flag flying before us on the other side. It was about viewing the field as a palimpsest on which he could see Albie Bluth, whom he had actually seen play, and all the other players he had known in all the other ages, moving in the shadows behind the current players on the field. It was about that bellicose, competitive thing in him that wanted to triumph and found its match in the game. It was about the neighborhood of these things. It was about the ritual of them. The bowl and football were to Vince a synthesis of everything about his childhood and age, of Yale and New Haven, and of the way all this could come together on a Saturday afternoon. 
Although there was something in Vince's vitality that fought the wave of death until it literally overwhelmed him, there was also something of his knowledge of death in his devotion to the necessary excellence of the buildings that will survive as monuments to what we cherish. He had such a perfectly tuned, acute awareness of death, which is, as Wallace Stevens said, the mother of beauty. A few months before my late husband's death years ago, I sent a New Year's poem that seemed to be about a football game that Yale had won with a fantastic Hail Mary pass at the end. The last lines were, then throw the ball out, man, just throw the ball longer than you've ever thrown before. And wake and when with every banner waving, your name announced in every trumpet call, your crowd and teammates ferry you ashore. Vince was the only one, the man with the power of vision and acute sensitivity to language, the man with the perfect awareness of the imperishable beauty humans should strive for, who saw what my verse was about. His was the tragic sense, joyful about life, despite facing the inevitability of oblivion, in which great buildings are a stay against what he termed nature implacable, human will unbreakable. He came up to me and said, that poem's not about football, Penny, is it? That's about Robert dying, the triumph of the spirit as he is being ferried ashore out of the arena in the arms of those he loves. Vince saw that. And that is what, with Tappy, we are doing here. We are, all of us, his family and friends, collectively ferrying Vince ashore in a place where his end is in his beginning, at home, in New Haven, and at Yale. Hello, I'm Stephen. The second of the, of the Scullies in their program. I thought I would recall a moment uh, from our childhood. The date is 1957. We are living in Greece for the year. And at this moment, we are at Marathon. I'm 10, the middle of three boys, all five of us, my mother and father, my brothers and I, are packed in a der the very car that Mr. Loria has just mentioned. It's a tin can of a vehicle. Front and back seats are made of rubber bands covered in cloth. It's got a canvas roof which can roll down from front to back. We all love this thing. It's little more than a circus car, as you've already heard. As its name implies, it has two cylinders, and struggles against the wind and groans going uphill. At the moment, at Marathon, we're on the flat, just under the shoulder of the mountain, with the road, such as it is, running straight to the sea a mile away, eight stades, according to Herodotus, where the mighty Persian army has disembarked from its ships. Dad puts the car in full throttle, and we race across the plain as fast as the car can go, just as the Athenians in full battle gear broke into a run, racing to clash with the Persians who had landed on their shores. Dad starts shouting, Thalassa, Thalassa, <laughs> the sea, the sea. And we join in, roaring as loud as our lungs can. It's an exhilarating experience, 60 years ago now, also more than 2,000 years ago. We are the ancient Athenians. We're Americans in Greece. I can still feel the rush of it. The battle for freedom, thalassa, is a great word to shout. Did this moment, did this year, turned me into a classicist. Probably in some way, but I couldn't say just how. Other things 
about my father much more obviously did. My, fascina my fascination with the Greek gods, dad's love, my love for Greek polytheism, his persistent passion in questioning what makes for community. How does a community conceive of itself? How does it share in the divine, if at all? What gives it shape, cohesion? How do buildings, how do individuals fit together or not in making something greater than the part? These are things, abstractly speaking, I teach, that I write about. I think of them as Greek questions coming from Greek authors like Homer, Hesiod, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Plato. But I also know deep down that they come from you, Dad, that they are inspired by your own questionings. This is a bond that keeps us close in some sense, and in some sense makes scholarship autobiographical. And that is probably a good thing, too. This is the Greek moment I wish to share here with you today. And indulge me as I end my remarks with words I spoke at Dad's burial. As the obituaries testify, many who hardly knew our father loved him. And what they loved about him was that he enabled them to see what they had only dimly imagined before. And he gave them soaring words to help them see what they now saw. What I want to say here is that I loved him for the same reasons, although I would phrase them a little differently. Dad taught me to look and look and look until I finally saw. He gave me the drive to look until I could see. He also gave me the confidence to trust what I had seen. And he gave me the confidence to trust my imagination in extending what I saw into an expressive narrative. These are the gifts of a great teacher and of a great parent. Thank you. For most of his 64 years of teaching at Yale, Dad's office was on the arch bridge over High Street, with, with, it, with windows looking toward Sterling Library. Downstairs was the slide room, first in what is now the art gallery, and, and in, then in Street Hall. His slides were always close by, always watched over by Helen Tillman. Twice a week, Dad would walk those slides up High Street, past Harkness Tower, and keep moving toward the beloved Egyptian great gate at the Grove Street Cemetery, but always stopped at the law school auditorium to perform his magic with those slides and send so many forth to see the world anew. Fact is, it's hard to talk about Dad without his side-by-side -side slides. Picture this, on the left, a high street bridge connecting the art gallery with street hall. And on the other side, at the other end of high street, the Egyptian gate to the Grove Street Cemetery. Together, these bookend the space of high street. You could say, call this dad's space. In December, we buried dad in the Grove Street Cemetery now he is, has completed the full length of High Street from the bridge to, street, to the Egyptian gate. Appropriately, he is now essentially on axis 
with the law school auditorium across the street and within the shadows of where his high school once stood, which is uh, Morrison Stiles now. He is in the perfect place. Uh, during World War II, while on a ship off the Sicilian coast, Dad saw his first vision of a Greek temple ruins rising above the ocean, a vision that he never, uh, that he carried him all through his life. On his cemetery stone will be a drawing by, by his son John, our brother, um, of a temple ruin posed above the earth and between the earth and sky, above the ocean. Um, thank you all for Dad. Besides being Dad, you established the thematic axis and focus of my work. Much love. But how does one thank Tappy? Tappy has made had so much to do with his attaining the life well lived to 97, and in the style with which he did it, Tappy. Yale has been the very center of Vince's life since that first football game with his father 93 years ago. It would have touched Vince beyond telling that Yale would memorialize him in the splendid way it has done today, that these friends and family would have spoken so fondly of him, and that all of you would have braved the call to be here, especially my friends from Virginia. I am emboldened now to say anything at all, because I love Vince and promised him that I would speak if any memorial service was held for him, if indeed. And because I do want to assure you that although he has been in exile from his beloved New Haven for the last six years, and oh, how he missed this place, and to show you that, although Parkinson's took a toll, Vince did enjoy life bravely until a very few weeks before his death. Vince decided to leave our dear little house in New Haven simply because he couldn't climb the stairs to the only bedrooms in the house. And we had my parents' home in Lynchburg with a bedroom on the ground floor. His family and many old friends hazarded the trek to Central Virginia. He struck up new friendships there, and one of his dearest, very dearest Lynchburg friends, Don Giles, died only this morning. He nurtured in Lynchburg a new passion for the opera. He played those discs at an ear-splitting decibel level <laughs> while he pedaled away on his exercise bike for the better for part of a daily hour until just a month before he died. And he recognized arias that his mother had sung so well. She was a semi-professional si opera singer so many decades before. Of course, Vince read incessantly. He read everything. He wrote a little. He agonized over the present peril in which the country finds itself. We streamed movies nightly. He missed rowing so much that he took his rowboats to Lynchburg just so he could look at them. He missed teaching so much that he made new pupils of his long, young therapists. He gave them classic novels, then discussed the books while they exercise together. <laughs> no one has mourned Vince's death more than our husky, Enzo, who would not leave Vince's bedside until the end. Vince did not talk much about, about death, except to say how much he hated to leave this beautiful world. 
but more than 30 years ago in a film he made for New York's Metropolitan Museum. He did talk about death in relation to a painting in the collection there. Before we all gather again for a reception just across the way, um, a reception at the Art Gallery, I think it only fitting that we give the last word in this service to Vincent himself in this clip from that film. This painting by Duran called Anatopsis, which means roughly a view of death, best sums up all these images. The title is from a poem by William Cullen Bryant, a very strange poem for a young man to write, in which he attempts to reconcile mankind to dying by pointing out that the majority of mankind lies dead in the earth, and that when one dies, one goes back as it were, home to nature, and becomes part of it. And the painting is like that. Under the trees, there's a quiet burial ceremony. Up to the right, magnificent alpine masses loom, and castles of great antiquity rest upon them. But then, down toward the light, again as in the oxbow, goes the lovely garden out to the transcendence of the distance. And so one is made to feel that in dying, in being put to rest in the earth, there is a great peace, and the earth itself celebrates the grandeur of the coming. And out beyond, in the distance, the light of transcendence flares. All of that speaks very close to American needs, it seems to me, at any time. For an American who travels to Europe, all of a sudden there's the realization that there is another attitude toward death than ours, one in which it's more natural, precisely because the fathers for so, so many generations sleep there. And it's this, that attempt to reconcile Americans to death, to the common fate of all mankind, it's with that that Thanatopsis, the poem, and the painting deal. To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks a various language. For his gayer hours, she has a voice of gladness and a smile and eloquence of beauty. And she glides into his darker musings with a mild and healing sympathy that steals away their sharpness ere he is aware. When thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over thy spirit, and sad images of the stern agony and shroud and pall and breathless darkness in the narrow house make thee to shudder and grow sick at heart, go forth under the open sky and list to nature's teachings. So live, that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death, thou go not like the quarry slave at night scourged to his dungeon, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust. Approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down. To pleasant dreams. That's what it's about. That's what Americans are trying to find in the continent. They're trying to find that past, those fathers' graves. They'd like to belong here. It's not possession. The furniture doesn't do you that much good in that way. The silver, the great chess, the glossy clothes with the bright buttons on them. In the end, you own nothing. You go back. But you belong to the land you return to. And there's another kind of hope in transcendence. <laughs>